Hi, everybody. Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. We are wrapping a series today, and it has been such a good one. It's been called For the Love of Facing Your Fears. And we have really just talked about so many interesting subjects that we tend to avoid. And so staying true to the theme of the series, we are approaching yet another topic today that almost everybody gets freaked out by. This is one of those, like if you look at the top 10 fears of the average grown-up, this is usually number one or number two for everyone across gender, across ge- geography, across demographics. Um Because today we're talking about facing the fear of death and navigating the end of life process. Um, Because you know what? As it turns out, we really are all going to die. All of us, every single one of us and all the people that we love too. And so, because we're just human. And so we will, and most of us already have faced death in our lives. Um, our own and other people that we love. And yes, it can be scary. And yes, obviously, this is the stuff of the deepest emotion, um, which often makes us want to be in denial. But that's not Mm -hmm. hopeful. It's not useful. And sometimes it's not even true. And so if we can educate ourselves now so that we can face death and dying in the most lovely way, in the most beautiful way, connected way, um, what a wonderful goal. Um, and so we have a guest this week who's phenomenal, just phenomenal and surprising. She's here to talk through this with us. We have Hadley Flahos. She's a nurse with a really interesting story and a really compelling purpose in life. Um, she was raised really, really strict and started questioning her own beliefs in high school after a friend's sudden death. And then she got pregnant at 19. She mentions in the interview and was kind of shunned a little bit by her community. And she dropped out of college to enroll in nursing school thinking, well, I need to have a career to support me in this baby. And then nursing became more than just a job for Hadley. Uh, It became truly not just a gift, but a calling because she chose to focus on palliative care and hospice care. So Hadley wrote this beautiful moving book called The In-Between, Unforgettable Encounters During Life's Final Moments. And she shares some incredible stories of people that she's worked with, her patients. And you'll see it in our conversation today, but she's a gifted storyteller, uh, so much so that when she started sharing her experiences on TikTok, She's got uh, something like 1.4 million followers paying attention who are intrigued by her journey and what she's learned about the end of life and end of life care. And so I loved this conversation today. It's so beautiful and hopeful and calming and centering, encouraging, because yes, though death can be such a hard topic, one that we're usually scared of, I think you'll see today It has a lot to teach us about how to live and maybe it's not quite as scary as we thought. In fact, it could even be beautiful. And so please enjoy this conversation with the just lovely and darling Hadley Lajos. Hadley, hi, welcome to the show. I am, I'm just delighted to meet you. I Your work is so important and so interesting and your point of view is so refreshing. And I'm just, I'm so glad you're on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I've told my listeners a little bit about you, kind of what you are out here doing in the world. Um, But we always love to hear the beginnings of people's stories and you have one just like everybody else does too. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about the elements of your life, the circumstances of your life that got you into a place where you are now focused on palliative and hospice care? I mean, I don't know that you saw that coming. 
I don't know yeah, that that was absolutely. what you planned on. I definitely Talk did a not. So I went to college to be an author. Uh, life had other plans for me. I had my son pretty young and said, I need a career that is going to support us a little bit better. And nursing fit that bill very well. So I went through nursing school, had no idea what kind of nurse I'd end up becoming. And I ended up working in a nursing home. And that is where I saw hospice. We had many patients on hospice. Uh, we did not have much experience with it in nursing school. And I saw the nurses get to be one-on-one -on -one with the patients, which is very different than most types of nursing. And I said, that's what I want to do because I was just so burnt out from having to juggle so many patients at once. And so I took a job in hospice and there was a moment where I had a patient who was give, giving me like updates on the news and stuff like that. And he knew I was a single mom. And right before he died, he said to me, uh, thank you so much for giving me something to look forward to instead of death, uh, just by him having like a little job. And I, in that moment was like, oh, th this is what. I'm going to do for the rest of my life. This is where I need to be. Wow. So you immediately went into hospice work and, um, and you're young, of course. And so I, I find this so refreshing um, because as you well know, our attitudes and even fears around end of life care, around death, um, around getting older are just um, outsized, I, I, unfair in some cases. And so um, it's so useful to hear stories like yours, um, where you offer us this beautiful, dignified look at uh, what the end of life can be and often is. And so um, let me ask you this first, before we kind of drill into some of your experiences. Um, because this this is your daily work. And so I am guessing that being around death in so many forms daily can, can be hard uh, or can wear on you or linger, um, even though there are so many like beautiful and encouraging moments too. So um, would you tell us first, as a woman, as a mom, and as a professional, what are some of the the guardrails you put into your life to keep, keep you sort of above board, keep your head above water. Yeah. I was not very good at this at first and ended up in therapy because I was just giving, giving my all to everyone and was finding eventually that I just wasn't being a good nurse, a good mom to anyone because I was just trying to do way too much. So one thing that I have done is that when I'm not working, I'm not working. I don't give out my cell phone number to patients anymore. I used to do that. Um, and actually, I found it to be more safe to say this is someone who who is they're going to not fall asleep and they're they know that you might be calling. And I used to just answer the phone no matter what time of day or night it was or if I was working or not. And it was making me not a great nurse. The next day to all of those patients, which wasn't fair. So now if I'm not on call or if I'm not working, I am in mommy mode. And that that is that is something that I've really had to to do. And that that has helped tremendously. Mm. So let's let's start here. Um I I am guessing that a lot of our confusion. And then thus fear probably around death is that we truly don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how we're, it's going to feel. We don't know um, what the experience is going to be like. And so, I mean, in just like the brass tax terms, like bringing it down to like a bunch of us normals who don't work in nursing. Can you explain to us, knowing that there is no one story, obviously, but what the process of dying often looks like versus our ideas of what it's going to look like. Yeah. Most people think it's very sudden from TV shows. There was a recent study that over 80% of what we're shown on TV is just, it's violent. Um, it's very violent and sudden, and that is not reality at all for what most people are going to go through. 
And in reality, the way I always kind of compare it to is, is birth, just like how our bodies know how to give birth and they know how to, to grow a baby. And then, you know, it's labor time, majority of the time, um, just like majority of time with death, our bodies do know how to die. And as we go into that process, it's pretty gradual most of the time. Um, we stop eating as much because our butt, we don't need these bodies anymore. We sleep a little bit more. Um, we slow down. A lot of times we'll be in the bed a little bit more. And gradually, most of the, most people will be in a coma a couple of days before they die. And the moment before they're in a coma is what I call the in-between where they're sleeping a lot. And we get these little glimpses of what I consider to be the other side as they talk to people who have passed on. And it's very gradual. It's very peaceful. I'm not scared of death and I've seen it more times than I can count. Hmm. That's a lovely thing to hear. Um, as someone who is bedside and you really know what you're talking about, this is really, um, the experience that you are able to bring to us. Can you talk a little bit more? And obviously, you know, this, cause so many people are interested in, you're just a natural storyteller, but, um, what are some of those like tender or lovely moments in what you call the in-between? Uh, of course, you're just, ob you're just observing. So this is your best guess as well, but um, I'd love to hear more about what you, what you've seen there. Yeah, it's truly incredible. And what a lot of people don't understand about it is that what's so interesting is that patients will see these people who are deceased, just like they see you and I in the room next to them. So they'll be talking to them and then they'll talk to me. And I've had a patient say, uh, have a conversation with his sister about like a trip that they were going on is how he put it, uh, that he was about to go on a trip with his sister who I knew was deceased. And then he turns to me and he's like, how are your kids doing? And it's very interesting to see. It's almost like, I'm just, I just can't see someone there. And, um, there have been some absolutely beautiful moments. One of my favorites was, uh, I had a patient that got out of bed that I had never seen out of bed. Um, so I was pretty shocked to see, to see him out of bed. Uh, but there's something that some people get called the surge of energy, which is this one last, like, you know, hoorah. He was out of bed playing hide and seek with his daughter who had drowned when she was a child. And it was incredible to witness. Um, and also for me, very peaceful to know that that is who he was going to go be with. And he was going to be happy and okay to be reunited with her. Um, we've also, uh, we see spouses come a lot that have already passed on sometimes kids that pass before the uh, parents and it always brings the patients a lot of peace, which is so important mm. to me. It's not scary for them. Yeah. Uh, I've only sat with one beloved person as she passed. Um, but I was surprised at how gentle, how quiet, how connected it even was. And I thought I would be scared and I was actually so grateful to have been there and just kind of, you know, born witness to that. What do you wish, what would you like people to know about hospice care? Because unless you've experienced it, it's a lot, some of us have, but unless you have, it's an idea and some of it is nerve wracking. Um, and so what, what can you tell us about hospice? I wish a lot of people know, knew that it was not giving up. I hear that a lot, um, that people feel like it's giving up a fight or we use like fighting terms for it. Um, and in reality, it's not, it's just people taking their destiny into their own hands is how I see it. And I see it as very empowering that someone has said, you know, usually in cases of say like cancer where they have been, okay, do this test, get this lab drawn. Now you need to go to this doctor's appointment. Now chemotherapy is on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and this is, this is your life and your life is determined by someone else. And for someone to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go home and I'm going to be with my family 
and I would like to remain comfortable, I think that there's a lot of power in that. And I don't see it as giving up at all. I see it as taking your fate into your own hands. Let me ask you this, because your work is just as much with the families as it is with your patients, of course. And you're part nurse and probably part counselor and part pastor and part sister. And um, you, you care for whole units and you care for your patients and the people that love them too. And so, as you know, even, even talking about death and dying, talking about end of life wishes is still such a hard subject for so many people that um, rather than face that directly with their families, it, it, it's just a bury the head in the sand um, subject. And so how would you suggest as someone who's now so comfortable with the discussion and the language and the words and the ideas, broaching the subject particularly those of us whose parents are aging and um, and how do we bring this up in a way that isn't sending alarm bells off or what are your best practices? Yeah, I actually do it every year with my parents and my grandparents. I just say, um, it's like tax season like now. And you just say, Hey, you know what? I was looking over what my wishes are and like my will and like what I want at the end of my life. Um, I just want to review them with you just annually. And, um, can you tell me yours just so that we make sure that we're all on the same page? Like heaven forbid, I don't want you to ever have to use this information. Um, but just in case, can you tell me what you would want? There is this online booklet called five wishes. Um, I believe it's free, but it will walk you through um, the different decisions you would need to make or someone would need to make for you and like tell you in very layman's terms what what these different decisions would mean. And it's only like five or six pages. Like it's very small. It's great. So that's pretty much what I go through with my parents every year. And I'm like, is this in this situation? Would you want that? And what I always think is so interesting is that um, – that surprise, because you really do think that you know what someone would want. And then sometimes it's like completely out of left field. And you're like, wow, I really am glad that I had this talk with you because I have seen far too many people get to a situation where they're having to make decisions for a loved one. They never had those conversations. And sometimes I worry that they're going to live with the guilt of, did I make the right decision for mm -hmm. the rest of their life? That's so good. And I think it's like so many other things that we avoid out of fear when the, the fear is not um, directing us to a, a healthy place, of course, at all, that once you actually have that conversation, it takes the, the, the air out of the balloon. You know, it's, it's not that scary. We can talk about these things. We can write it down. I mean, the, it's not as impossible as it sounds. Yes. And you can go at it with humor. And actually I was the, you know, talking to my mom the first time we had this conversation and I was like, you know, I don't want to be kept alive if I'm not going to have quality of life, mom. And she was like, no, I am going to keep you alive. I will not do that. And I was like, thank you so much for telling me you're not making my decisions. Dad will. <laughs> totally. Um, <laughs> um, I got divorced three years ago and having been married for a really, really long time. And so all of a sudden these questions were on my plate in a very real way. Like I am in charge of my directives and my end of life wishes, and I cannot burden my kids with this. And so I went, I have two sisters and, um, we just laughed so hard because I'm like, one of you would pull the plug on me if I had a head cold. And the other one would keep me alive on machines for 16 years. And I'm like, I need you two to somehow form one person and, and do the right. So anyway, writing down, uh, it can be funny. And it can, because life is and family is and um, dying is a part of life. And it's a part of all of our families. And um, I appreciate you helping us learn 
how to talk about it, which brings me to your book. So you've written an incredible memoir. And look, so I loved hearing you say you were going to go to college to be a, a, a writer. So you found a way to merge your two big ideas in life. And so I love that. So let's talk about your book a little bit. And how did you find the writing process? Because of course, at this point, you know, you're in work that is of the body. You is your hands. It is your mind. It is mobile. It's moving. It's physical. And then you write a book and it's so cerebral and it's so isolating and it's so crazy making sometimes. So first of all, how'd you find the writing process? I really liked it. Um, I, it was very emotional. I didn't really expect, I thought it was just going to be like, okay, I'm just going to write down these experiences that have been, I've talked about them. They're, they're amazing experiences. Um, but I had to, to get all the little details and the little nuances, I had to put myself back in those rooms again and almost grieve the loss of these patients all over again. I would just be sitting there at my desk, just bawling. And what was so interesting about the writing process for me is that usually when I write, I'll write like, okay, this is my little writing block and I'll write two hours here. And what I found I had to do is that whenever I felt called to a certain patient that morning to just clear my schedule and spend the entire day just putting myself back in that room and reliving the entire experience and writing. And that is how I wrote most of the book. Majority of those time block writings were uh, editing and stretches of days where I would just sit there and live with these patients again almost. It's very strange. Mm. And cathartic and beautiful and hard. I, I know exactly what you mean. Going back, right? When you think, gosh, I wonder if I could recall all of it. And then when you give yourself the immersive gift of time to go back in your memory, you just all of a sudden recall smells and textures and uh, so many small details that are wonderful, but vivid. Can you talk about, of course, you've given us a couple of such lovely examples already, but um, your this is your, it's your memoir. It's memories of these end of life moments and these patients that you've worked with. It's such a lovely collection. Do you have a, um, a couple of favorites that you included? Yes, definitely. Carl is what I call him, who was the one who saw his daughter and who I was just so incredibly close to. That was one of the few patients I've had where, um, for me, I'm usually pretty good about the line of like, this is my patient and I am here to serve them. And although I will pick up things from my patients along the way, I usually won't even tell them or their family about what I'm picking up because I don't want to put my own problems or burdens onto them. So I just kind of take it with me and, and use it internally. Um, but that patient was one I was so close to. I would consider to him to almost be like a grandfather figure for me that it became very difficult for me to find that line. And even at his death, I remember calling time of death with his wife by my side and just bawling as soon as it happened. And I, his wife came over to hug me and I just remember apologizing saying, I'm so sorry. I am supposed to be here for you. You are comforting me. I feel horrible. I'm so sorry. And she just pulled me back and said, no, we are comforting each other. And me and him, we love you so much. And please don't say that. And that will probably always be my favorite patient. So I actually dear. just went and saw him the other day. <laughs> Did you? Yes. Mm. I haven't seen him in a little bit, but I went and talked to him the other day. Are all of your patients um, older or do you do end of life care for people of any age? I am 18 and older. So I definitely do have patients that are younger. Most of my patients are older older though, of course. And then we do have pediatric patients. I am just not the pediatric nurse. We have one who's specialized in that, but sometimes I do go see them because I can get to them quicker, things like that, but they're not necessarily my patients. And that is a whole nother world, to be honest. Totally. Uh, and I wonder about your patients who are um, younger and and their families and how those experiences for someone who got sick 
or, you know, was wh- whatever the, the circumstances are bringing them to the end of their life sooner than anyone expected. Um, do you find some of the same principles still apply even then, even in unexpected when, when you're losing someone too soon? Yeah, absolutely. It's not incredibly different to be honest, which is always so interesting to me because sometimes you'll see a family just grieve, um, a page I had one the other day that was 108 and they, they were grieving this, like it was just unimaginable and no, no hate to them, you know, that I totally understand it. Um, but even things that are expected, so to say, sometimes you just can't prepare for it really. 108. Yeah. Is that the most senior patient you've ever worked with? No, I've had patients older than that. Unbelievable. Wow. That's incredible. Um, if you were going to give your advice, uh, to how best prepare ourselves, how best to prepare our loved ones for the process of dying, even if we're scared of it, which most people are, um, I'd love to hear that. What you think as, let's just say we can see the end. We're not to it, but we see it approaching. Um, What, what do you start telling your patients and their families? Here are some, here are some ways to make this the most beautiful that it could be. Yeah. I say that, that you talk, uh, talk as much as you can. Um, I really wish more uh, people would just talk to uh, each other about the end. Um, surprisingly, even though someone's in hospice, I still see a lot of hesitancy to talk about the end. And my patients and and many of the other hospice nurses I've talked to express that patients feel like every time they try to bring it up to people, people will change the subject because it either makes them uncomfortable or they're like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Like, I just, I, I want to enjoy you here. It's all with the best heart and best intentions, but it can sometimes make the patients feel very alone and like they don't have anyone to, to talk to about it. And many people do want to talk about the end and what will happen after. I find that with a lot of older women, um, they want to hear that the family is going to be okay when they are gone. And they want to, they have a problem if the kids are fighting or they want to know that they will all still love each other and get together for Christmases, so to say, and having those conversations. But that takes the first leap of having the conversation of when you're gone and, and addressing what is actually happening. And when they can do that, I do find that patients feel a lot more peace around the end and what is coming. Yeah. Have you, um, just by virtue of proximity, borne witness to families who, or family members, I should say, who reconcile right at the end? Um, And what has that looked like for you and what has that taught you anything? Yeah, I have. And it, it's, it's interesting. I find this coming up more and more and I always support people who do want to come at the end, even if it's been um, a long time, um, as much as I support the people who say I cannot um, because that, that has been happening to more and more, I'd say. And I try to support them just as much through that. Um, I have had to, to tell family members before, um, that a patient, this happened not too long ago where a patient was just very upset about everything. She was mad at me. She was mad at the kid. She was just, she was mad at everyone. And I finally turned to her with just us in the room and said, what, what would look, what would a good day look like for you? Like, how can I make, make, give me an ideal day for you. How can I make it happen? And she turned to me and she said, all I want is for my kids to stop fighting. They think that they are in the living room and I can't hear them. And I can, I can hear them and I can feel, even when they come in here and put on a smile, I can feel the tension. And I had to go out there and say, y'all, this is why she's so upset with everyone and everything. And she just told me this. 
And, you know, they hugged and they cried and I got the social worker involved. And that for me, although it wasn't necessarily a patient and people reconciling, um, it meant a lot. And I was really happy Mm. to be able to help facilitate that. Can you tell me a little bit more about your role? I mean, obviously you're a nurse, so there's the, there's the medicine and the, 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 the keeping the patient comfortable and all, you know, all the sort of medical physical side. Um, when you think about your role in these moments with your hospice patients and their families, um, where are your lines? Like, where do you end and they begin? Um, what are, what are the boundaries look like there? Uh, cause again, you're, you're almost like a counselor there, um, with these families and these really tender moments. I, I'd love to hear your thought. It's such a, it's such an area of specialty. It is. And it can be very hard to learn those lines at first. And I try to take new nurses under my wing to really learn them because we want to connect with our patients. And the easiest way to connect is to look around the home and find something that you know about and you can relate to. I recently had a patient who was um, cooking, his wife was cooking red beans and rice and he was a chef and I was asking for tips on cooking. And really the best way I know to not insert ourselves too much, which a lot of nurses can make the, can fall into that pitfall of then putting their own problems onto patients. Um, What, what I always tell them is say, just keep the focus on them and just let them tell you everything so that we can better serve them. But hospice nursing is a very gray area and just being in patients' homes as opposed to like a hospital already makes that a little bit difficult because you're sitting there hearing like what you would in the hospital about their troubles and their medical issues, but their dog is asleep on my lap. And it, it's just a whole other level, but it's what I love about it. It truly is. Yeah. Um, how are we doing on hospice nurses? Are we in a shortage? Um, what would you say to young students who are drawn to nursing, uh, who maybe either are or have not yet considered your particular specialty? Yeah, we're, we're in a nursing shortage for sure. Um, hospice nursing, absolutely. We, we definitely do. I, I wish people would consider it. A lot of people consider it more as like, oh, near the end of my career, I'll go into hospice. I'm usually the youngest coworker. Like all my coworkers right now are 50 plus. Um, but I wish more people would consider it as their their role like I did going in early Uh, patients usually really like uh, being able to give you advice. They like the um, feeling like they're making that difference with you. And I wish people understood that it is a specialty just like anything else. And you will learn uh, so much about pain management and taking care of a person as a whole. And if you like it, I think you should try it but I think a lot of people don't think of it as a specialty as much as say ER or ICU or labor and delivery, but it is, you, you specialize. I I wouldn't really be able to go into any other line of work now that I've been a hospice nurse for seven years. Yeah. Yeah, Cause I've specialized in it. Yeah. I can imagine that when you walk in the, the room with your young, fresh face, they're like, (laughs) Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we talk about see this dying, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Guys, I'm here to help. Um, yeah. Let me just ask you this last question. Um, what, um, what if, if anything, would you say has been the most surprising to you in these seven years? Now it's no longer an idea. It's not theoretical. You now have I can't hundreds probably right of patients that you've now worked with. And so what, what would you say is the, the most surprising thing you've learned? I did not expect for my patients to change my life. I thought that this was just going to be another job. I just, 
once I started learning to listen to their advice and listen to people who have lived entire lives and take what resonates and leave what does not, I did not expect it to change me as a person. And I think what I've learned the most is that I think it's a nice idea to say to live life to the fullest, or I think it's a nice idea to say that we should uh, take hold of every moment. And I think it's a whole other thing to to see people in their last moments so often Mm -hmm. and to have that reminder in your face all the time that one day that will be me. And there are times when I'm waking up in the morning and I don't want to do anything. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to, I just want to lay in bed. And I realize that one day I'm going to be in my patient's spot. And you know, what, what am I doing today that I would be really excited to be telling my hospice nurse about one day. And it's really given me a really incredible drive and passion for life that I Mm. just totally didn't expect. That's gorgeous. I love that answer. What a lovely thing to say. Right. What stories do we want to be telling when that's us? What's the life we hope that we get to talk about at the end on our last days? I think that is so lovely. And thank you so much for for being here. Thank you for sharing what you see and what you've learned. I mean, for so many people, there is a reason so many people are following you right now. Um, It's because it's comforting. It's comforting to hear what you have to say, and it's it destigmatizes a pretty big fear shared by a lot of people. Um, and so it's wonderful that you get to bring your actual experience to bear here. Will you tell my listeners, please, before we go, where they can find you, where they can follow you, what your best kind of social is, um, and of course, where to find your book? Yeah, uh, Nurse Hadley on every platform. And then my book is called The In-Between Unforgettable Encounters During Life's Final Moments. And you can get it anywhere that they sell books. That's so fantastic. Plans to write another? Yes. Hopefully. Yes, good for you. <laughs> I figured if you had a some sort of hunger in you to be a writer in the first place, I'm like, oh, this won't be the last. <laughs> and you're, you're so full of stories. You're going to have stuff to talk about forever. Just forever. I'd love to see a book of some of the best lessons you took away from your patients. Like, I'd love to hear that. Like, these are the best piece of advice, pieces of advice that I received that I've rotated in my life. Anyway, you're going to have no end of of material, but um, thank you. Thanks for coming on today. I'm just delighted to have met you. And um, just appreciate your time so much. So thank you, Hadley. All right, you guys appreciate her so much. Uh, You know, we always video our interviews so you can watch them if you don't, if you would like to. So if you go over to my YouTube channel, you can watch this interview, which I I would love for you to do because Hadley is just like a fresh young thing, like here on the pod talking to us about end of life care and um, just, just such a darling person. And so Uh, I hope that this was encouraging to you. I hope it took a teeny bit of the stigma and fear out of this conversation. And I also hope it gives us the courage to talk about this with our families and our parents and our children and not leave this as a big, scary mystery, but rather one that we can enter into together, connected, super aware of of what everyone wants and the wishes of the people that we love the most and prepared to meet this with grace and dignity. So anyway, um, I hope you've liked this series. Oh, facing your fear series has been amazing for me. Um, and if you've missed any of them, go back and pick them up. You guys go ahead and subscribe to the show. If you haven't, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast and you'll never miss a single episode and then join us next week. So we kick off a new series, you guys, um, on behalf of the whole crew, we sure love you. See you then.